Hello everyone and welcome to this talk, the MariaDB evolution. Is it just a fork of MySQL? Well, spoiler alert, it is not. It's a bit more than that. My name is Alejandro Duarte and I work in developer relations for MariaDB PLC. I'm a software engineer. I have been writing code for almost 30 years, I believe. And I published these three books about web development with Java and a framework called Vadin, which is very, very interesting. But I'm working on a new book right now called MariaDB for Developers. So if you're interested, take a screenshot of these and um, you'll get a notification when the book becomes available. But today we're going to talk about the MariaDB ecosystem, the Sea Lion ecosystem. So we're going to see the historical context in which both MySQL and MariaDB were born. We're going to also talk about storage engines, right? So a bit more technical stuff. We are going to talk about MariaDB Enterprise because that's what you want to use when you move to production, especially if you want to automate things such as failovers. Um, we are going to briefly touch also on the present and future of MariaDB and migration and who uses MariaDB, okay? So let's start with the history of relational databases and it's gonna be very, very brief. So it all started in the 60s with uh, General Electric and the integrated data store IDAs. That's the very first database we know of. It is not a relational database. It's another kind of database, but that was the very first one. And that led to the development of something called the Codacil database model, which basically were extensions to the COBOL programming languages so that developers can uh, query the databases using nested loops and pointers. So they need to think about you know, data structures, algorithms, all this kind of stuff. That means they have to rewrite this codacil code on every schema change. So Edgar Code realizes this and proposes the relational model, which is uh, oversimplifying is like uh, tables. So you have columns and then you have rows. That's what the uh, uh, modern databases use. And he was a mathematician, so he formalized these through something called relational calculus and relational algebra, which is what uh, actually databases use. Although modern databases, they are not just purely relational algebra based. They have some more con um, concepts there, but these are, this, is, this is the basis, all right? And um, these, uh, these kind of uh, theories allows you to demonstrate that it is possible to build query optimizers. And yes, they build also these query optimizers that all relational databases have. And, you know, a database is, it contains tons of algorithms and data structures, right? Like trees and hash tables and so forth. And it knows your data, so it can make very, very good decisions on uh, the plan to access that data in, in on disk, uh, much better than what a programmer um, would be able to do. Now, all this is theory until the first implementations start to appear. So in the in more or less at the mid of uh, the 70s, uh, uh, in IBM, for example, System R, which more than a product is a, is a project, okay? It's a research project um, investigating and researching databases. So they started to implement these, to, to, you know, to experiment with these. Ingress in the University of uh, California, the precursor of PostgreSQL. Um, Oracle, very famous database. Mimer, another academic project in Sweden, the University of Uppsala, I believe. And the predominant uh, uh, query language was called QL. So let's try to remember this, this word there, QL. That is a... Uh, querying using the English language, all right? That was the main language there. Now, later at the end, uh, by the end of 70s, uh, maybe at the beginning of the 80s, uh, uh, or, or maybe, uh, I mean, this is uh, through the years, this, uh, don't pay too much attention on the exact location of this vertical line in the timeline. Uh, uh, the, the scientists at IBM and the researchers and programmers at uh, IBM started to, uh, to think about how to, what would be the best way to query uh, databases, relational databases? So what's the best way to specify queries using a relational environment? That's what SQUARE stands for. 
And more than a language, it was kind of a game they had, like I said before. Like uh, they are trying to figure out, hey, I found out this way. Maybe I come up with this idea, how we can combine these. And, and yeah, maybe it was also a language. And, but they were using the scientific notation, right? So it's subindices and superindices. This is hard to introduce in a, in a keyboard, computer keyboard. So they redefined these and created something called SQL, which is the SQL of Quill, right? So they are playing with the words. Um, this is like an improved version of QL, maybe. Um, they named it like that. Now this can be implemented and used in computers. However, SQL was a trademark in some uh, company in the UK. I think it was some aircraft related company. So they cannot use this name, but they removed the vowels in this word and well, SQL is born. So even though it, it is spelled as SQL, you still pronounce it SQL, or we still pronounce it SQL. Some of us, some produce, some, some pronounce it SQL. It doesn't really matter. Mm, it is here today. It's the uh, best. It's not perfect, but it's so far. You, no, nobody has come up with a better uh, language than than SQL. Now IBM two, uh, sorry IBM DB two, Oracle and Sybase, the, the main databases in the market, started to uh, adopt uh, this language SQL. And it became a, a standard, I believe, in 1986 or 7, or around those two years, uh, ANSI and I, ISO. Now, to give you some, a, bit, a bit of a perspective on what's going on in the industry, by the late 80s, open source is pretty well established. With, for example, the GNU project, they uh, created something called the General Public License. <clears throat> which means that if you release a software with the GPL, you have to provide also the source code and people can modify it. But if they modify it, they have also to publish that source code. So it's like the source code is going to be um, available always. That's the GPL. Now, Linux is being developed here in Finland by Linus Torvalds. It's, it was published under at some point under the uh, GPL. Uh, Postgres in the University of California, Berkeley, uh, is uh, the academic project uh, trying to build this uh, relational database. is under development. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, really um, it doesn't use the GPL. Uh, it is still open source and it's a very permissive uh, uh, permissive uh, uh, license. Uh, however, there are no free SQL databases because Postgres wasn't designed to support SQL. This changes with the very first free SQL database that was called MSQL or Mini SQL. Um, it offered better performance than Postgres uh, and, and SQL. Uh, it, it is still used in embedded devices. In fact, the latest version was published, well, that date. So it's not very active in development, but it's still in use. Uh, however, there's no open source SQL database because this one, yeah, you can use SQL, but you cannot see the source code. So you don't have that option. This changes with MySQL and its creator, Mikael Videnius. So he was working with his company and his colleagues, and he wanted just to you know, provide good services and good products to uh, his customers. And he created something called Unirec to manage databases. And on top of that, he started to develop its own you know, uh, uh, SQL layer, so to speak. And later they called it MySQL and published um, publish the uh, the source code, uh, uh, you know, the open open the, the source code. Uh, it's a very fast database. You wanted a very fast database, performant, easy to use. The two things that you can still see today in on MySQL in MySQL and MariaDB. Yeah. Then in the 90s it had its limitations, but it turned out to be a great fit for a website. So we can say that it helped shape the internet as, as we know it today. And it was released at some point under the GPL license. That means it cannot be uh, closed again. So MySQL gains popularity very quickly uh, in the uh, next decade. Uh, a company called Innobase produces or develops these module for MySQL. Let's call it like that, module, mm. InnoDB. That solves the limitations. And uh, a company is created to, you know, to uh, um, provide services and that kind of stuff. But then Oracle buys InnoBase, which is, um, like I said, employs the developers who are uh, writing the code for InnoDB. Uh, Oracle bought that. Okay, that was in uh, 2005. Then later, Sun Microsystems buys 
MySQL, uh, the company, MySQL Finland AB, in 2008. And then I guess some of you remember what happened next or kind of uh, guess what where this is going. Oracle buys Sun Microsystems. So that was announced in, in uh, 2009 and effective in 2010, I believe, uh, in January or something like that. And now Oracle at this point owns not only the Oracle database, which is the most successful commercial database, but also the most popular open source database, MySQL. So the community and especially uh, Mikhail Videnius uh, realizes that this is a risk for the project, for MySQL, and um, at least there could be some uh, conflict of interests, right? Uh, that's just natural. And this could maybe even halt the project or maybe stop innovation or reduce it. I'm not going to be the judge of that, but I'm going to show you this uh, conversation I saw on the official um, MySQL um, community uh, Slack, whatever. I don't see much innovation in the 8.1 innovation release notes. There are plenty of deprecations. Is that the new definition of innovation at Oracle? Well, of course, they are joking. And I'll let you decide whether there is a, a, a truth in these uh, jokes. Um, props to Oracle because the project is still alive and they are still innovating. I'm not sure how much though, but um, but the project is, is, is alive. Uh, mm, however, Mikhail Vinenius forks this code. That is, he takes the code and copies and publishes it uh, uh, somewhere else in another repository and creates a new project. And um, many of the developers of MySQL, the original developers of MySQL, they, they moved to this new project to, to MariaDB, right? So that's how MariaDB was born as a fork of MySQL. Indeed, it was a fork of MySQL and it was supposed to be a drop-in replacement for MySQL and it was for, for, for some time. Nowadays, they're, let's say, they are highly compatible. There are not two other databases that are as compatible as MySQL and MariaDB. Mm. However, projects have diverged, right? And as you can see, it's like, it, I, the way I see it, at least, is that uh, MariaDB, it's like, because it, it, these are the guys who built MySQL, they are working now with, with MariaDB. So it's more like a, a, a change in the name, and then the other company uh, continued to keep the, the name, and, and obviously some of the developers and stuff. Um, and, and both projects benefit from each other, I would say, at the development uh, level. Anyway, the first release was MariaDB uh, 5138. We are on 11 something, so it's been a long ride since then. It has to honor the GPL license, obviously. Mm. And so that means it's going to be continue to be protected, just like MySQL, at least in terms of availability of the source code. About development, we don't know, <laughs> right? I mean, you saw the conversation on Slack. Now, uh, in the case of um, MariaDB, it gained popularity very, very quickly, and it became the default database in the many Linux distributions. And you can see it here, for example, in the Debian PopCon popularity uh, contest, which kind of sends um, you have to install this package in on Linux on your machine, and then it sends. Uh, uh, data on what packages you have installed. So you see the MariaDB server package uh, gaining and taking over uh, uh, MySQL in number of installations. And it's not just on Linux, also on Windows, you see more and more installations. This tells me, in my opinion, that more developers are using uh, MariaDB as well. So not, not only in production, but you know, developers are, are choosing MariaDB. Now, uh, the MariaDB uh, Foundation was created to, you know, to protect uh, the source code of being controlled by one, one large entity so that innovation continues to happen. Uh, also, the MariaDB Corporation was uh, founded, now it's called MariaDB PLC, um, and they offered uh, uh, services, but also products, and most of them open source. So for example, faster connectors. Connectors is like drivers or APIs for Java or um, Node.js, uh, C++, Python, to connect to MariaDB, and they are faster than those in MySQL. Now, they also created an additional storage engines. So what is that, storage engines? Let's talk a little bit about storage engines, and there are many, many storage engines. Uh, here you see in NodeDB again, 
Uh, right, so in fact, it, I said it's a module, and yeah, that's true, it's a module for MariaDB, so it's something you put in MariaDB, MariaDB comes with several of these, not all of these, some of these already when you install it, but you can put more there or remove them if you want. Um, InnoDB comes there, that's the, the, the one that you are going to use most of the time. <clears throat> Ironically, you have horizontally column store right in the middle for analytical workloads, so that's for uh, you know, for the average of the numbers in these columns, it's going to be much faster than other uh, storage engines. So for reporting analytics, you can do uh, these with MariaDB as well. Mm. You have what is uh, MyRox, initially created by Facebook, for, um, you know, workloads that are write heavy. You have tons of, of writes. And uh, maybe the opposite, Aria, which is like Maria without the M. Uh, many reads, but very, very few um, writes. You can store it in memory, as you can see there, CSV. Uh, you have a spider for, for database charting that is like dividing the data in multiple nodes so that your database can grow. Uh, even uh, you can optimize on the cloud with S3 and uh, many others. Okay, so uh, let me show you these. So let's say we have an application in which uh, people can make tons of comments, right? And then we expect quite a lot of those. So we create the table comments, some columns there, and then we say engine equals my rocks done. This is optimate, opti optimized for writes. Okay, so we're gonna save money probably on, on, on these on storage. Now in the same database, we have categories, some columns there, but categories, they don't change ever. Maybe they change every 10 years or whatever. So we can say engine equals area. Uh, to be honest, you will use probably InnoDB here, but you can you can use uh, any of the others, even memory, and then just load them when the database uh, uh, starts or, or I don't know, use any kind of uh, strategy. Mm. You can do this with MariaDB. You can have in the same database these two kind of uh, tables with different storage engines. And since they are on the same server, the same database, you can run a query like select some columns, let's say all the columns, from comments, join categories, that's mis mixing this data, add a condition to filter the data, and as you can see, we have in the same SQL query, we have two storage engines. That's pretty cool. Okay, if you want to learn a little bit more about the kind of different workloads that MariaDB offers and what makes MariaDB unique, uh, this is a good video where I quickly, it's a very short video where I quickly uh, mention some of these things. Anyway, so let's talk about production because production is very, very important, right? So MariaDB Enterprise is made for that and it's built on top of open source software, okay? Mm. Now, uh, I call it MariaDB, uh, oh, I call it Enterprise Subscription but, and it includes something called MariaDB Enterprise Server, which is based on the com community server, which is free. And um, it offers uh, more, um, uh, you know, larger maintenance um, window, uh, up to eight years. I believe the community server it's like one year or so. Don't believe me, but <laughs> check check uh, check the policies online. But um, it gotta be something like that. It's not it's not it, it's a big difference in the in the maintenance uh, window. It offers also the possibility to run non-blocking backups so that operations continue even if you are taking a backup. You need to stop operations. Uh, enterprise audit if you have to comply with some, you know, um, certifications or uh, or this kind of stuff. Uh, same with security. Uh, any kind of, uh, uh, what's the word for this? Uh, you know, you have to comply with some policies or standards. Uh, uh, MariaDB Enterprise offer, offers more options for this. Now, it also offers something called max scale, which is, a database proxy. By the way, so MySQL, the name My, comes from Mikhail Videnius' daughter. So that's uh, he has a daughter called My. I don't know. Maybe in Swedish it would be like Me. Uh, let me know if you speak Swedish. How would you would pronounce that? Um, and uh, he also has another daughter called Maria. So you have Maria DB, and he also has a son called Max. And so you have Max scale. So that's uh, an interesting fact right there for you. Um, let's talk about the uh, max scale then. It's a database proxy. That means that it's something that sits between a client, in this case, a web server with an application, web application, and the database. But the web server or the application says it's talking to the proxy, but 
directly physically into Toxic, but it thinks it's talking to the database or the, the, the server, right? Database server. And the server or the database thinks it's replying to the client. That's what a proxy, generally speaking, is. And um, I call it intelligent because it understands SQL. So it can make decisions on, for example, where to send a query if it's a cluster of multiple database servers or what to reply if I need to, you know, modify the, the, the results somehow. It is all uh, configurable. That's the idea of a database proxy. It also understands MQL. So you have a, maybe a web application in Java or Node.js, and it uses the MongoDB driver. So now it's, it has to use uh, MQL, so the MongoDB query language. So instead of using MongoDB, you can send those queries to MaxScale, and MaxScale translates that to SQL and it stores the data in MariaDB. That's pretty cool. So you have all the data in a relational database. The advantage being that if you have other other applications that use relational databases, you have all the data in one single database. So you can use one single query to join the data from multiple uh, uh, applications that use kind of a different you know, nature, like SQL and NoSQL in one single query. That's pretty cool. If you want to experiment with these, I have this video where you, you get access to this uh, Docker compile, Compose file, and it, it spins up all the services, max scale, and uh, mm, and you don't have to do much. Just you can just run a query using MongoDB uh, query language, and then another one using SQL. But you don't have MongoDB really, and then you can combine the data, both both uh, SQL and NoSQL, so to speak, data in a single SQL query. It's pretty cool. Uh, did I mention that MariaDB uh, max scale was in intelligent? <laughs> well, it also understands Kafka. Now here I put the uh, database server on the other side. And you can uh, basically, what you can do here, what this enables is uh, something like uh, change data capture. That is uh, sending uh, database uh, change events. Events like uh, changing the schema or in data to Kafka and from Kafka to any other kind of uh, uh, system, including MariaDB. You can send it all to another MariaDB database if you wanted. For example, one that has column store, while this one has InnoDB, that one would be for analytics. I don't know. Uh, there are many possibilities. So uh, CDC, and you can do the opposite. You can do data ingestion that is storing data that comes through Kafka in MariaDB, pretty cool. Now, this is a very interesting use case, read-write splitting. So let's say you have these two database servers right here, and then you configure MariaDB replication, which you can learn with this video. So this one, this code takes you to the channel, so you can just subscribe. There are plenty of interesting videos, especially by my colleagues, I have to say there are top-notch experts in the database, in database technology, I would say. Anyway, so you have configured this. You put max scale here. You configure it so that it sends the writes. It's very, very easy, actually. And it sends the writes to the primary and the reads to the replica. So the prim everything you write in the primary is because of MariaDB replication is going to be available in replica. So you can read from the replica instead than, 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 than from the... Um, primary. And then your web application or your applications, you send the SQL or connect, connect to the max scale proxy. Remember, it's a proxy. So the application thinks it's talking to a database and it thinks it's talking to one database. In fact, the connection string in the case of Java, that's the example, but similar in other programming languages, the parameters would be similar. Uh, it thinks it's just one endpoint. That's it. I'm going there. It's one, but actually there are two nodes. In fact, we can add a new one and the web application, you don't need to restart it. You don't need to stop it, nothing. It continues to work. It's just now can, you know, it can work more uh, efficiently with reads in this case. We are scaling reads horizontally. And you can remove also the replicas later, later when you don't need them to save money, for example, in the cloud. In fact, you can change the whole thing. You can change these to now three different clusters or availability zones or even um, clouds if you want. And data is replicated there, I don't know, with InnoDB and the column store nodes for analytics. Um, the web application it still doesn't know. It continues to use the same connection string. It thinks it's one logical database. In fact, there are many nodes, as you can see there. So this is topology isolation. It's isolated that it can evolve. It can be evolved. Okay, so automatic failover, which is pretty cool. Let's say this is the primary server in this cloud. And... Um, you know, this one is managing all the writes. So if it fails, 
then we cannot write data anymore. That's bad. But MaxScale detects this automatically. You don't have to do anything. And then it picks another one, reconfigures it, and promotes it, promotes it as a new primary. That means that the web application continues to write data. Maybe there's a slight you know, short delay in the, some of the write operations while this configuration is taking place, but it doesn't fail. Then later, maybe the uh, failed node uh, um, recovers, or you restart it, or it restarts automatically, whatever. MaxScale detects these and now reconfigures it as a new replica. So all of a sudden, you have the same capacity, assuming nodes have the same you know, capacity and they are identical. You can do the switch over through a UI that MaxScale offers, uh, a web-based GUI or GUI, and, uh, or the command line or, or you know, your own script or, or configuration files to, you know, to always use, to, to kind of uh, restore it to where it was before manually. You can do that. Uh, that was automatic failover. Let's talk a little bit about the present future of MariaDB. Today, we, you can deploy MariaDB anywhere. So Docker, for example, I deployed with Docker Swarm, I believe it was this. Uh, this uh, deployment of MariaDB in this Raspberry Pi cluster that I built, I didn't have it close to me right now, but it's pretty cool because you can disconnect one of these cables, the whole thing continues to, to operate. Uh, MaxScale is replicated. I think I have two nodes. I think it's the two top nodes there. Uh, I installed more, uh, MaxScale there. Uh, so it, and it, it replicates the, the configuration. So I configure one, the other one changes accordingly. So it's pretty cool. Um, you can deploy in the cloud, obviously any cloud. Looking into the future, the teams are working a lot in, on uh, Kubernetes deployments and orchestration and um, AI capabilities capabilities. I'm not going to talk too much about it, so stay tuned for news on these two fronts. Migrating to MariaDB is actually very easy if you, for example, do it from MySQL. And uh, these are the main um, servers, other servers that, um, that we see that people migrate from the most to MariaDB. But this boring, this documentation, what I wanted to show you, it's actually a feature that MariaDB has. So you can say set SQL mode equals Oracle. Or put it, or put this in a configuration file somewhere with a different, slight different syntax. Now MariaDB understands Oracle. Well, it doesn't understand all the dialect of Oracle. That would be crazy, uh, but it helps with migration a lot because it's uh, you know you get closer to it, so you need to change less things. The same with PostgreSQL and the same with uh, SQL Server. So that's a pretty cool um, tool for migration. Who uses all these cool stuff? Well. Here you see some usage around the world. So you see Asia, United States, Germany, Brazil, Mexico. Well, there are many. These are the, the countries with more downloads, right? But they are used, uh, MariaDB is used uh, everywhere globally. And remember, it's open source and it's backed up with these companies, which are huge. So this project is not going to disappear, right? I don't need to mention or say anything about these companies. You recognize them. Um, some notable users. Um, uh, Wikipedia, when, when you read something on Wikipedia, you are reading information stored on MariaDB. Samsung, if you have devices uh, uh, that are Samsung and you log into their networks, you are using MariaDB. Uh, Nokia, Red Hat, Google, DBS. DBS is a huge uh, a bank in Asia. They migrated from Oracle to MariaDB and they are very happy because they are saving a lot of money and they gain some functionality as well. Um, these are some notable users, but actually 75% of the Fortune 500 companies use MariaDB, so most of them use MariaDB. Now, it's not only big companies, because MariaDB has more than 1 billion downloads on Docker Hub. <laughs> That's quite a lot. Now, in conclusion, we saw the MariaDB evolutions in the 60s when you store data in, on tape, this kind of stuff, up to today, where uh, you maybe even with a few clicks have the database running in the cloud, fully managed sometimes, or on your Raspberry Pis, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going uh, production with Raspberry Pi, although I bet it has been done, it might work even, I don't know. I don't know for databases though, but uh, hmm. it is fun to do it for experimentation. Anyway, we saw this, I want to leave you with this message. Nobody says Ubuntu is a fork of Debian or Microsoft SQL Server is a fork of Sybase, unless they are making a historical Remark. In the same way, MariaDB is much more than a fork of MySQL, and I hope 
you saw why this is true and learned something about MariaDB or databases, uh, try it out. Uh, it's a lot of fun. These are my, my coordinates. Feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.